Hey everybody, this is Human Factors Cast, episode 31. We've got a great show for you today, like I say every week. Uh, we got some fun stuff with the Human Factors news, some dating relationship stuff, and all this exciting stuff. And uh, we're also going to play Guess That Human Factor, uh, Human Factors Cast. That starts right now. To Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. <laughs> hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode. I don't even know what that intro was. Welcome there back. Then we start with the giggles. Yes, you are listening to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by the one, the only, Blake Arnsdorf. Hey, what's going on, everybody? A great Monday to be back. Oh, man. It is uh, the last Monday that we will be recording on. Not that Human Factors is going away, but that was a fantastic transition into our administration note. We'll start off the hour with an administration note, and we'll get a little sound effect here going. Administration! Uh, so, yeah, like I said, this will be the last Monday that we'll be doing this uh, due to changing schedules. You know, we're all very busy people. And that's one of the reasons why your favorite, Billy Hall, cannot be on the show tonight. Um, he's got a new work schedule, so we got to kind of work around it. We're going to be doing this on Tuesday nights, so you can look forward to your regularly scheduled Human Factors cast uh, starting now, I guess, every Wednesday. Uh, we'll release this episode, and then next week it'll be Wednesday. Or, or I guess Tuesday night, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the administration note. Administration note over. <laughs> Blake, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing fine. <laughs> doing is, good, man. It's, this is uh, a it's weird good to show. be back for another week of Human Factors news. How was your week so far? Uh, so or how was your Monday? <laughs> so far, it's a Monday, man. It took me like three hours to get home. It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> California drivers do not know how to drive in the rain. And also, I got a new prescription for my glasses. I, well, I got new glasses, and the prescription is really, really strong. So if I'm if I'm seeing things or saying weird things, that's probably why. Um, Watch out, kids! Nick's on that strong. Uh, right, I'm on that strong prescription. That strong uh, uh, visual. Wow, I can't. Okay, words are hard. All right, you know what? Let's just move <laughs> into human factors news. This is the part of the show all about human factors news. Now, this could be anything from my favorite virtual reality to your favorite automation to psychology. Let's not lose those roots. Design anything basically that has to do with the field of human factors. Blake, what's up first? So let's kick it off with a little bit of dating. So a new study reveals that online daters will initiate contact with people who don't have the characteristics they want to mate, despite having a wish list stating their preference for potential ideal matches. What? The finding was revealed by researchers who analyzed the online dating preferences and contact behavior of more than 41,000 Australians between the ages of 18 and 80. A lot of dating news this week, but I thought it was I thought it was a little strange that people go after a completely different type of person than what they are actually looking for, or I, not necessarily somebody that with the characteristics they listed on a online app. I mean, you know, it makes it makes sense because you you have this potential wish list, and then you see something, and you're like, oh yeah, that's what I want. Just kidding. Um, like I don't know. This will work. This this will work. This is good. This is good. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, this this is uh, this is Australia. So, I mean, this is not. I mean, can we can we? There's this whole uh, field of like weird psychology. Have you heard of this? The Western industrial or wait, Western educated industrialized. Um, oh, weird is an acronym. Yeah, Western. No, I've definitely not heard this. Oh, okay, yeah. There's this whole field of psychology, and this might be getting a little bit out of, you know off topic but uh, it's important to note that there's western educated industrialized uh i'm forgetting the r it's like rich or um something and then uh d is democratic and basically i i forget what the the r is but essentially most psychology studies or most studies just in general are done on these populations so any of those five attributes, uh, except for the one that I couldn't remember, 
Any of those? Oh, five? I got you. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's Western educated and from industrialized, rich and democratic yeah. countries. Okay, so okay. it was rich. Yeah. So so um, basically, can you generalize that to all of humanity? Basically, uh, but this is talking about dating apps and uh, dating online dating. So I guess you would only do that for, uh, you know, Western industrialized. <laughs> I don't know how that works. Yeah, actually, I guess that makes sense. The thing is, I mean, it's a pretty big sample size, even though, I mean, it's localized to one area. Yeah, yeah for but sure. By far, the best part of this story for me is that the end range for a dating app in this specific instance is 80 years old. I, lo- I, I don't oh, know. Oh, wow. I just see some <laughs> old 80 year old just killing it on a dating app. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, that was a really, I, I, that's ageist of me, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, no, it's cool. I mean, look, here's the thing. It's so hard to get out there and organically meet somebody, right? Uh, and, and I mean, they even say that in this article. They say how people go out about finding a partner is changing dramatically thanks to the internet, right? Uh, where we were once limited to settings such as school, work, social, gather- social gatherings, or local night spots, there is a much wider choice at hand online. So... I don't want to say this is interesting because that is literally the tagline of every story every week. But <laughs> yeah, I know it's the worst. It is the but, worst. But I mean, it, it, it's cool. Or dang, that's another one. That is right another there. one. That no, it's uh, it's. Uh, it's it's a, nice to watch society change so dram- dramatically, though, because it wasn't too many years ago where it was insane to be thinking, "Oh, I'm going to meet people on the internet. Uh, yeah. oh, I'm going on a date with somebody on it the was internet." I mean, taboo. now it's commonplace. Right, it was taboo. They made a whole movie and a whole TV show out of this uh, phenomenon called catfishing, which is um, somebody pretending they are somebody else online. Yeah, it's it's changed a lot. Um, they're basically, yeah, you're right. Octogenarians is what they call them. They, they don't want to call them eighty year old octogenarians. All right. That's all right. an epic name. So, are you ready for the next one? Well, hang on. Closing thoughts. Yeah. If you are online dating, stick to that wish list because uh, that's what this story was about, right? And um, if you see something better, if you see something that you think might be better, just remember that wish list should come first. All right. What's up next? All right. Yeah. So given the chance to see into the future, most people would rather not know what life has in store for them, even if those events could make them happy. According to new research published by the American Psychological Society Association, excuse me. So two nationally representative studies, including more than 2000 adults in both Germany and Spain, found that 85 to 90 percent of people would not want to know about upcoming negative events in their life and 40 to 70 percent of participants prefer to remain ignorant to even upcoming positive events in their life that's really surprising to me yeah uh but so only one percent of participants consistently wanted to know what the future held for them so nick what do you think about this so i mean this so so this is uh the whole idea of pleasant surprise would be no more if you knew exactly what would happen right i think that's why that's why the percentage for wanting to know what's positive is a little bit less. You know, I, I, these numbers make sense to me. If you knew that something bad was going to happen, that part doesn't make sense to me. But the fact that knowing that something good happens a little bit more, like more people want to know what happens in a good way. That makes sense to me. How are you feeling about this? Do you, would you want to know your future? If, if, uh, Someone came to you and was like, "Blake, I know your future." Do so, you know? from personal experience, no, I wouldn't, because I had a friend of mine who, like, he went to a fortune teller. I know this; this is like co- totally off the bandwagon. But he went to a fortune teller, and it it seemed to mess him up for a long time. <laughs> he was like certain of things that were going to happen in his future, and some things did unfold as as were said. But I guess the part of the study that surprises me is there's only like a 1% of participants out of 2,000 people across two two seemingly different countries and cultures wanting to know what the future held. And I mean, in some ways, it would be kind of cool to know and see if you could change it. That was That'd be my only like ask of being able to see the future is like, well, what if I could change my destiny because I know what right now this Blake 
is going to see in the future. I think um, it, well, yeah, and I mean, just based on the questions that they asked them, it's largely dependent on context because, you know, there's a, I bet you there is a lot higher of a percentage than 1% than of people who would want to know the sex of their unborn child. And they even mentioned this. This is a survey item in this study. Yeah, and again, we're asking people about something that's not really possible right now through survey tools. So, I mean, right. there's, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's yeah, interesting because even with 2,000 people, I don't know what the true populations of the two countries combined are. This could be a small amount of people actually that took a survey. Right. This is uh, uh, yeah. this might be a testing and evaluation issue. But um, no, this is this is interesting though because oh, I did it again. This is uh, this is fascinating to me because there we go. it relates to spoiler culture. Like, how many people have you talked to about? a television show or a movie that has come out and you just plug your ears and say, no, 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 no spoilers. I think. Oh yeah. I, I do that with everybody with game of Thrones. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Like I would never want to spoil that shock and awe for somebody who hasn't seen the series because it was so visceral. And I don't know if that's because you haven't seen it in a television show really before. I mean, it's just so unexpected at the time. But there's this whole spoiler culture where people are just like, no, I don't want to know. And I mean, even even I find myself reflecting like when I was when I was a child, I wanted to know everything about every story. I want to be, you know, when when my mom used to read me stories, go into bed, I would always be like, well, how does it end? You know, I always had to wait for the next day. But no, I wanted to know. And now the more the older I get, the more I'm like, no, I just I want to experience it. And so it's. It's fascinating that that maybe this is a reflection of spoiler culture. Yeah, and it could be. And I I think I'm starting to see the other way of this right now because if you knew so, or if you're able to tell some of the negative events like you knew you were going to die at this age of this thing yada yada. But what if you knowing that so early on affected the po- all the positive stuff that was going to happen in your life because all you could do is dwell on the negative. So I think I'll stick with my original pause and say, I don't want to know. Right. Let's just experience it. Yep. No spoilers. All right. Speaking of spoilers, what's up next? Oh, so we've all been down the rabbit hole of endlessly watching YouTube videos. Uh, perhaps a bit too much <laughs> as this statistical show or these numbers will show, excuse me. So YouTube says people now watch, this is scary, 1 billion hours of video every single day. That's 1 billion hours of video every single day. But so Blake, YouTube, YouTube says it hit this milestone at some point last year. Then why didn't, why wasn't this like a big deal back then? Um, but there's, so there's reporting. obviously a rapid increase in viewership. So for just for reference, a billion hours is equal to o- over 114,155 years, something like half the time humans ever, <laughs> ever wow. even have been on this planet. So given YouTube has over, over a billion users, that suggests the average somewhere in the average uh, views per day is about like an hour at a, hour per day. Dang. So the power of cat videos is very real. Dang. This... Uh- I'm just how do you how do you fit 114,000 years in a single day? I I just I, I don't, don't even, even have know. That but time. this is this again like this is kind of like the dating culture thing how it's just a shift like we really are we're turning to different devices for entertainment and even news it seems like we've, and YouTube is a big place for that. We've become a consumer culture uh and it's to watch it unfold, right? Like I feel that in the future, robots will take our jobs and the only jobs left will be those which are for creators. So the only thing left will be to make artistic content and everything else, the day to day uh, will be handled by computers and robots. I, I feel like this, this is coming. And the fact that we're shifting towards watching 114,000 years worth of content in a single day across all human beings. That's astounding to me. That is crazy. Yeah, so I mean the time is nuts, but what I find really interesting is it's this moving away from our traditional types of media like into the internet. 
and mobile devices specifically, I think. Uh, so I don't know. It's 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 crazy that there's that many people that use one service. Even more insane that that many hours are spent using a service like YouTube. But uh, I don't know. The world is shifting. I think you're uh, you're heading in the right direction. Talking about a lot of automatization automatization of jobs now and content creation being a, a big job for humans in the future. Right. All right. What's up next? All right. So driving, driving, driving and death. So if succeeding control of your car to AI scares you, this demo is not going to ease any of your fears. So this demo created by a 17 year old, that is awesome and awfully young, uh, 17 year old designer and engineer. If I mess your name up, send me an email and I'll apologize. Uh, so it's, I think it's John Hoonerman. The, appli- the application acts as an ongoing project journal. So this, his goal is to create a fully self-learning agent capable of piloting a car in a 2D environment. The, this is a crazy part to me. So this application is built on JavaScript, just basic JavaScript and allows the, then the application allows website visitors to watch two cars pilot their way around pre-built obstacles. So the users are building those obstacles. Uh, Or you can up the ante and build your own robot roadblocks. The cars are capable navigators. However, they struggle when users draw items onto the map. But for every obstacle the tiny cars run into, the deep learning algorithm that, again, this 17-year-old designer and engineer has built in Germany figures out what's good and what's bad. And over time, that algorithm is going to weed out the bad behavior until you're only left with well-behaved cars in a 2D environment. So so the uh, the premise of this, basically, is it's a web-based thing, and you have these little... They look like ants to me. They're, they're cars, though. They're supposed to be representations of cars, and they have a, a set of sensors that go off in any direction that you would find on an automated car. And users can go in and draw little shapes and the cars will actually try to learn how to avoid these. So it's object detection and object avoidance is what this algorithm is doing. Yeah, which doesn't seem all of that insane, but I th- I just thought it was pretty cool that it's built on just straight up JavaScript and it's thrown on the internet and that it continually learns. I mean, that's the... <laughs> The whole machine learning paradigm is very interesting to me. It's a yeah, big, big thing right now. I agree. And I mean, this is like, I'm not trying to undersell this at all. This is a 17 year old who built this in JavaScript to illustrate a complex problem that a lot of the world's engineers are experiencing right now. This is phenomenal. This is, this is pretty cool. Like we've come a long way from hello world, right? With this. Oh yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> Uh, like, I think I'm lucky if I can make a calculator work in, in code, but this is, I'm, I'm watching these things go around and around and I'm wondering if there's even a, um, let's see. So there's not like a website you can go to, to try, or is there? Oh yeah, Uh, there it is. There it is. Yeah. I see it. All right. Hang on. Okay. So these guys are driving. Can I, oh, yep. I just drew something. Okay. I'm trying to do this live in the moment. Wow. They are like. Avoiding everything. I wonder if I just like circle in. Well, that's the thing. I wonder how long it's been available now. Yeah, and how much data it's collecting. That's what's really like, uh, oh, I got them both stuck. They crashed into each other uh, because of the limitations of the screen size. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Well, the code is available on GitHub if anybody's kind of interested in how much data has been accrued. I'm sure you can poke around on there. Yeah, you can also go to figure it out. His name, Jan Hoonerman, um, dot com slash project slash learning dash two dash drive. Now, again, for all our listeners, we do post all these links on our Facebook page when we post the show notes. So or when we post the show, so that way you can both listen to us and read along and check out these articles. That being said, Blake, what is the next article up next? So we've talked about this a few times over the past couple of weeks. So it's like every week. And this has to, yeah, every week. It's been so brain computer interface system, so BCIs. But a new brain computer interface system allowed three paralyzed individuals to type words up to four times faster than the speed that had been demonstrated in earlier studies. 
The promise of brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, for restoring function to people with disabilities has driven researchers for decades, yet a few, devi- yet few devices have, are ready for widespread practical use. Several, op- several obstacles exist depending on the application. For typing, however, one important barrier has been reaching speeds sufficient to justify adopting the technology, which usually involves surgery. Yeah, that's a high barrier to entry. Oh, yeah. But a, a study published it Tuesday in eLife reports reports the results of a system that enabled three participants to type at least the fastest speeds yet achieved using a BCI, speeds that bring the technology within reach of being practically useful. So, quote, we are approaching half of what, what for example, I could probably type on a cell phone, says neurosurgeon and co-senior author Jamie Henderson of Standard U- Stanford University, Standard University, good. Um, so this is really hopeful. The only part that bums me out at the, is that it's half the speed of what you can do on a cell phone. But I guess that's a I'm that's looking at the glass half empty, and that's not right. what this is about. Yeah, I mean, if you if you uh, think about this in terms of information processing, they they say here that the patients achieve two point two and one point four bits per second. What that translates to in terms of like words per minute, I'm not sure. That that quote that you said is probably the closest we're gonna get. Um, but I mean. Is it is it typing on the cell phone or is it swiping on the cell phone? There's a couple entry methods that I'm curious as to what they're saying, but this is let me let me just uh, backtrack just a minute because it feels like every week we are talking about human brain interfaces. Now, yeah, and it all seems to be like coming one from because we're getting a lot of these from Scientific American too. Yeah, and and what's what's fascinating to me. Also, is that there? It seems like each time we talk about this, it becomes more and more advanced. Hold that! I'm going to hold that thought, Blake. What do you think about this? While I go check on something, uh, because I feel like it's. What do you think yeah, about this? Let me check. So something this quick. this is really it's it's I hate to say it, but it it's is interesting. interesting. But at the same time, I'm unsure of that barrier to entry the surgery i mean because this requires i mean this is coming from the article itself so you have to have uh let's see like a 16th of an inch electrode array implanted on the surface of your brain yeah no problem like it's an in cortical implant i mean that's no no serious or no small endeavor and then for the article to also cite that it's comparable to eye tracking technology I mean, of of course, for the sake of science, I get it. And I know I can't actually, you know what? I'll take that completely back. I cannot even imagine what it's like for people that are paralyzed like this and then the joy they must get being able to communicate at such a speed or at all with people. It just seems like so much risk uh, involved when technology is just not catching up. But again, this article is talking about that this is making leaps and bounds more than have been made in a decade. So right. It's, it's it's wonderful. I love to keep reading about this because they're all kind of related in the past three weeks or so to people with either prosthetic issues or, in this case, people that are paralyzed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking back on it. Um, and so we first talked about this with the locked-in syndrome. So That's what I was trying to pull out of my brain. Yeah, I couldn't yeah, think of what yeah. it was called. This yeah. is what I was looking up. So I'm looking up like what we've talked about, right? So uh, when Woodrow was on the show a couple weeks ago, we talked about locked-in syndrome. And this is basically them saying yes or no. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. They uh, let's see. We also talked about the following week was uh, Elon Musk talking about human brain interfaces and their importance. And then we had um, last week we had. Uh, oh, where is it? Oh, improved electrodes. Right. So it feels like every week they're 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 coming up with something. And now we have you can type with it. So it's like. Where will it be next week? We'll have to <laughs> tune into Human Factors Cast to find out where human brain interfaces are next week. Blake, right? I'm I'm excited <laughs> just for the next story. Like, I know. I, I don't know. This keeps getting next better. week on Human Factors Cast. Human brain interfaces allow us to control our cars. No, yes. seriously. <laughs> <laughs> seriously though, uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Honestly, man, the only closing thoughts I really have is I'm just where next. <laughs> this is like the time to be a scientist. Like there's so much coming together with 
between automation, brain science, and just the combination of integrating with technology into the brain. Plenty this is of, a really cool time to be alive. Plenty of work to go around. All right, what's up next? All right, so here we go. Not a fan of Trump. No. Can't stand <laughs> can't stand country music. No. Not at all. Think selfie culture is the worst. Yes. I don't know. I look pretty good. <laughs> Wouldn't go camping if someone paid you. Are you writing these for me? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote all of these for you. Okay. So a new dating app called Hater can help you find better matches by focusing on the things you and others mutually detest. In fact, studies have shown bonding over the things that you hate can be more powerful than bonding over the things that you like. Yes, an app that connects people, people who hate the same thing sounds like a joke. And in fact, that's how it got started. However, Hater, while like other, uh, sorry, however, while Hater focuses on dislikes, it's not the only dating app trying to suss out more information about users' personalities as a means of differentiating itself from the hot or not photo driven apps like Tinder and Bumble. And you know what? I think this is great because Tinder and Bumble, <laughs> you guys are great. I, I need get to move it. over. I see the point, but this is like actually getting people to connect on a real level. It seems like right. I wonder if it like if uh, if as you're swiping left or right, if you know they they say beneath your profile picture Trump supporter, and you just like, nope, I'm out. Um, <laughs> now what's it? <laughs> Billy mentioned something like this, and I'm wondering if it's the same one a couple weeks ago. Uh, Billy is known for uh, trying out all these dating apps uh, because he has a fiance and she gave him permission. Uh, so, so, I mean, he is our dating app correspondent. Dating app correspondent Billy Hall is out in the field. <laughs> no, um, yeah, this is uh, this is a great concept, and I believe we talked about it when he he tried out that other one that we talked about um, a couple weeks ago. I don't even remember what it was, uh, but yeah, I mean. This, mm, has potential it has potential i mean like if i was still on the market i would probably give this a shot i would probably give this a shot oh i just think it's hilarious that it's like connection through hate <laughs> like, like hate telling that to your friend you. like how did you meet her oh we both hate this thing <laughs> <laughs> i wonder okay i don't know it's just it's goofy so i wonder i wonder if you increase the likelihood of being chosen as a potential dating partner if you hate something that's incredibly unique like the more unique your hatred of something is the more like likely that you will meet a potential match does that make sense so for example i really hate it when you know i have audio problems on my podcast and um, I'll swipe right to that shit. Right? And and so, like, yeah, I'm wondering if there's somebody else out there who podcasts and is like, oh, I hate that too. And then, right, you just, and then it's a match. Yeah, it's it's because you would find a, no one else like that. Of a few hatred things, right? Because like reading Maybe. the article again, I mean, it basically shows you a topic and you swipe right or left whether you like it or dislike it. Oh, and then it gives you potential matches based on those answers. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there looks like there's a little more in depth. Like you can, you can like say that you hate something too, or like escalate it. But yeah, maybe that's how it works. I don't I'm know. sorry, I'm looking at this picture. Alexis, 85 percent match, hates everything. Oh, and my Amazon Echo just went off <laughs> because perfect. I said Alexis. That was excellent. Um, <laughs> perfect timing. Oh man. Okay. All right. So dating apps aside, what is up next? All right, so on to a little bit of one of my favorite topics in the news, augmented reality. So augmented reality may save you from road rage. My mom could use this. A heads-up display would let other drivers know your situation while driving. So when you're driving, it's easy, it's really all too easy, to rage at fellow motorists who are either in a hurry or taking their sweet time. After all, you're clueless to the context that they're actually in. So are they are they in a real predicament or are they just careless? Well, T U E and I looked for this earlier, couldn't figure out what it was from, but capital T, capital U, lowercase E, researchers have developed a mobile app called Carnote that uses augmented reality displaying displayed in front of you through a periscope lens add-on 
to let fellow drivers signal their intents and feelings. If you're in a rush to the hospital, for instance, you can notify commuters behind you so they don't honk their horns at you or chase you down. Thank really, goodness. Really quick. There are really quick. Yeah. Like the T U E is uh, probably Texas University El Paso. I'm guessing. Look at you go, man. Maybe, maybe I'm just taking a guess. All right, continue. No, that's pretty good. Cool. So there are limits to how often you can use it. So habitual speeders can't just leave it on and excuse their behavior. But early stage chess tests suggest that it does lead dr- lead drivers to be more understanding of each other. So like I said bef- in the middle of the story, my mother could use this sometimes to understand the context of other people driving. But it's it's kind of a sweet idea. What do you think, Nick? Uh, I think I could have used this today um, <laughs> because, I mean, being on the road when it's rainy, like sometimes uh, I saw a couple oh shit moments uh, on the road today where people were just driving carelessly. And if they could have been like, hey, I'm driving like an idiot. Don't be behind me. Uh, it would have been amazing. That's very true. Very true indeed. The the thing that it I mean it's a great idea, but it's one of these that you're gonna need to get it implemented quickly and in good position uh, because right. we all know that we're not that far from fully auto- autonomized cars. So I mean the the lifespan of this thing isn't gonna be forever, right? Yeah. Um, so that I was mean, the time. I'm telling uh, you guys. I'm just on. like, what's the input method? Did they say what the input method is in this article? Because I. I feel like if I'm driving, the last thing I want to do is like type a message that gets, you know, text on my phone, whatever, that sends out to other cars, right? That's not safe. Yeah, see, that's that's the biggest problem I saw, too, and I'll piggyback on that. I mean, it does say that it's a Periscope add-on, so the only way I can think of you could use it in your car is through your mobile phone. Like make uh, a quick video, app. make a quick video, and then send it off to the people. And I mean... well. I mean, it lets you live stream, right? But you'd have to be you'd have to be interacting with it. That's going to just provide a more right. dangerous situation. I mean, the article even calls out kind of another downside of this whole idea is that you would need it more so built into the car uh, as a heads up right. display uh, for it to be really that useful and maybe using yeah. voice control instead of any kind of physical input. I agree. Yeah, this is. Um, I don't know. It's okay. It's I'm I'm kind of lukewarm on it. It's it's neat. I like augmented reality and all, but I mean this is it seems like they're really stretching with this one. Especially yeah. because the communication between cars is getting better and better and better. So Yeah, cool little goofy idea, but you know, AR is what it is. So, we ready to move to the next one? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. This this guy's really might scare you. But anyway, have you heard a tiny bug in Cloudfair's clo- code, I can't emphasize how tiny, nicknamed Cloudbleed, has led to an unknown quantity of data, including passwords, personal information, messages, cookies, and more, to leak all over the internets. And when I say tiny bug, I mean it. So the vulnerability was produced by a single character in Cloudfair's code being incorrect, causing data to be written to the wrong drive. Whoops. So the so the good news is the vulnerability was discovered by Google's Project Zero security researchers. But the bad news is pretty bad. It, and the bad news is that Cloudfair's, Cloudfair-backed websites have been leaking data for months, dating back to September 16th. So Cloudfair's clientele includes heavy hitters like Uber, OkCupid, and Fitbit. This being said, now is a great time for every one of you guys listening right now to go ahead and rotate all of your passwords across web services, whether they're Cloudfair-backed or not. Yeah. This, uh, yeah. Oops. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, what else can you say? It's one character. And, I mean, they they didn't think it was malicious at all. Um, I think they definitely, it, it was one of those, it was just an honest mistake and it cost everybody a ton of information. And, um, I mean, it's, it still amazes me how, how, how code works sometimes. And the fact that we can't even reliably log into a website 
without some sort you know like we we have a password and i mean there was this idea a couple years ago for a pass ring where you basically keep this ring on you and you just tap it to get in um i don't know why that never took off i mean i guess maybe you could hack the the signal it emits i don't know um but you can hack anything now you i can mean hack this it. is based off of an accident on one code slip right yeah it, it's astounding to me but for our listeners um in general I'm going to go over some best security practices for uh, passwords. Uh, So here are some tips. Use a minimum of 12 to 14 characters. Password is not a password. Um, In addition to that, include a mix of numbers, symbols, capital letters, and lowercase letters. And lastly, it isn't a dictionary word or a combination of dictionary words, or it shouldn't be anyway. Um you know, you can also take additional security measures by adopting a password manager service like 1Password or LastPass and enable two-step verification when applicable. But I think 1Password was affected by this, was it not? I, I feel like I saw that on it. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a cloud <laughs> fa- Cloudfare back service, Whoops. If, if I'm correct. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> which is which is true, but I mean, I, I, honestly, guys, I cannot recommend two-step verification more. Oh I've yeah, had more accounts be hacked, and that's what caught it. Oh yeah, um, yeah, me too. Uh, Steam, yeah. EA, I've had a ton of them, and not PlayStation yet, but I've had a ton of them. Just go, did you log in? And I'm like, nope. And then do nothing. And if you did log in, then just put in this code. And it's amazing. It's amazing. And enable two-step authentication when you can. It's it's amazing. 100%. So everybody rotate your passwords and stay safe on the internets. All right. What's up next? All right. So have you ever wanted to feel smack of punches coming at you from sweaty aliens? Oh, yeah. The, the whang of, bullet, of a bullet hitting your guts? Ow, that sounds painful. <laughs> The feeling of hitting the deck as pirates stream over the virtual bow. The subtle vibration of VR sexual encounters with mini tentacle sex robots. Whoa. Well, Well, yeah. This was a family show. Yeah, it was. Well, here we go. The hard light (laughs) VR suit, which looks an awful lot like a motocross chess piece, uh, is ready to please. This vest contains multiple vibrational elements and can add an extra kick as you play VR games. It has 16 vibrational nodes and haptic sensors and is completely sweat-proof so you can work up a lather while kicking alien butt. Or, that's actually uh, pretty cool. Or that so sexual encounter with the tentacled robot. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of scary. I feel like that's uh, that's really freaky stuff. Uh, but anyway, so system works with VR systems or standard PC games. That's cool. You can play Call of Duty and feel like you're freaking out. Uh, so to use it, simply plug it in, plug in the four hundred and forty nine dollar unit, and start gaming. A uh, pretty reasonable uh, price for uh, for entry into um, haptic feedback. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's it's a cool notion. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I still. I would need this plus like the unidirectional treadmill. The omnidirectional, yeah. Perambulator. Perambulator yeah. is the uh, correct terminology for that. It's pre- oh, there we go. Perambulator. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we, t- we talk a little bit more about VR down below, but this this price entry stuff, it's it's too much. It's, it's got to come down. For now. Wait till it comes down. And then you'll have oh, that full. I mean. Oh, yeah. By the way, I just want to just want to point out, I, I think I have the episode title. This used to be a family show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That right. works. Yep, yep. Yeah, I like it. This used to be a family show. I have to say, that's one of my favorite attributes in the new format, that we get to choose the episode title based on the flow of the show. It's just it's just a little bit of added fun. It is. It is. And uh, you know what? When you when you see it and you, you hear it in the middle of the episode, it's just like, oh, yeah, I get it now. I get it. That's where it came from. All right. Uh, so... So Nick, you played a bunch of VR. Like yeah, you're much more experienced in it than I am. Would you would you take this thing on? I mean, besides the high price entry, do you think it would enhance the experience? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. So I want you to reflect back to the good old Nintendo 64 days, right? Okay. So you're holding that controller in your hand, and nothing happens. I'm holding it right now. Right. You're holding it. Nothing happens. As soon as you plug in that Rumble Pack. It was such a different dimension when you could feel stuff rumbling around 
before you saw it, when you could, when, when you beat a boss in Star Fox and the thing just went go crazy shaking, like that was a completely new experience, right? Oh yeah, I remember plugging that in and playing Raider Rumble. It was like a boxing game, and it totally changed right. the way you played it because right. you felt the hits. Now, now think about VR, which augments the way that you typically play video games, where you know instead of instead of using your thumb to locate your vision, you 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 manipulate your actual head to manipulate your vision. Now imagine that it, it's just what I'm trying to get at here is it's just one step removed from what we're at now. Now this is a rumble pack for your entire body. Um, I don't think you know you, you won't be able to actually feel like a bullet hit you, but I, I don't think the the haptic feedback is that intense yet. I could be wrong. I haven't tried out one of these. It is on my list though. I do I do want to try out one of these really bad. Um, but oh, it'd be so fun. But I do feel I do feel like this would act actually benefit the the i feel like it's that one extra step of immersion right because you can mask the senses but if you're not moving right that's so you you were right with the uh omnidirectional treadmill if you have that you're good uh and then with this it's just one extra sensory um input that you're getting while you're doing this and it just becomes that more real i like this idea i'm giving my stamp of approval as soon as i try it out there you go. What's up Nick next? Nick Rome said it here. Yes. What's up next? <laughs> All right. So th- this one, this sounded like something out of a Sherlock Holmes episode. But anyway, so here we go. Late last year, it was revealed that Amazon's Echo had been a key piece of evidence in an ongoing murder investigation in Arkansas dating back to 2015. As police oh. sought access to voice recordings from the smart home assistant. However, Amazon fired back, arguing that both user commands and Alexa's responses constitute protected speech. In a lengthy filing issued late last week, Amazon has pushed, ba- has pushed back against requests, arguing, arguing that while it has already compi- complied with requests pertaining to user purchase history, given the important First Amendment and privacy implications at stake, the warrant should be squashed unless the court finds that the state has met its heightened burden for compelled production of such material. That was a mouthful. I apologize, guys. Wow. But Amazon it used to be a family show. Yeah. <laughs> Amazon <laughs> representatives explained that while it intends to not obstruct the inst- the investigation releasing the records to governing bodies would violate consumer privacy rights citing a ruling the company was involved back in 2010 quote the fear of government tracking and censoring one's reading listening and viewing choices chills the exercise of the first amendment rights this was a this is a nuts one for me man like the fact that the amazon echo so quickly was involved in being evidence in a murder investigation and then the the kind of real conundrum we face with Amazon having to be like, well, we got to protect our our users. What if this was happening to a bunch of people, or how safe are they going to feel using their product in the home? Right. I mean, Nick, you have one of these. What I do. do you think? I, well, I think the FBI is probably listening to us right now as we podcast, and uh, they subscribe to our podcast. It's fine. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They they do subscribe to our podcast by going to iTunes uh, and and checking out Human Factors Cast, and they leave us a great five star review. Like you should too. Uh, okay, that was enough <laughs> that of a was plug. Awesome. Yeah, I like that segue. Um, no, this is, uh, I don't know. So w- I'm, I'm conflicted. So on the one hand, I don't care that there is an always listening device in my home uh, that can listen to every word I say. And it does. It listens literally to every word I say. There are probably servers somewhere that is recording every single word and storing it. Now, on the and, and you know, it, there are devices in our pockets that do this, and I think I mentioned this on another show. But the the phone that you carry on you in your pocket does this; it can do this. So, I mean, that's the real cost of using these things. Now, in terms of Amazon protecting their privacy rights, uh, I'm like fifty fifty on this one. I'm like, yes, on it, on one hand, like. It is a personal device that they have in their home. And to have that device tell on you when you've done something bad, potentially, that sucks. 
because you've you've basically done it to yourself by buying this device. But on the other hand, if you have done something bad, then that's your fault, and the court should be able to seize this device or the records from this device and convict you. So I'm going to say it's okay. Yeah, this one, this is a real sticky one for me. But I like we talked about this last week. If you have an Android, it's always listening to you. And even when you're not using like OK Google, that you can there's websites you can go to and you can listen to all the hot phrases that it's recorded. So I mean, it's yeah. out there, it's sitting on servers, it's accessible. I think this is just something we're going to have to get used to as part of our future. Because uh, I mean, smart homes are coming, and yep. it's it's not going to be just Alexa. It's going to be a bunch of devices in your home, from your refrigerator to your couch to your belt. So smart I don't belt. know. It's it presents a serious conundrum because if your if your data is really no longer that private, uh, what does that mean for you? But if you're I don't know a typical law abiding citizen by this no stretch of the imagination, right? What harm does this do? Exactly, exactly. If you had nothing to hide, then why are you scared? Okay. And if you do, don't buy the stuff. It's right, fine. Right, there you, you know. go. All right, Blake, what's up next? All right, so back to YouTube and some more virtual reality. So YouTube has already perfected the art of mixed reality videos that show the VR world and the real world at the same time. So picture watching somebody play a VR game and seeing the game behind them. So a great example of this is the video of Conan O'Brien's virtual trip to outer space taken when he visited YouTube's VR lab. I've got to check that out. So the video's <laughs> platform technique still can't capture the whole picture, however, since VR headsets get in the way, so you can't actually see the face. You're, you're occluding the eyes and some of the expression. But, of course, Google Research and Daydream Labs teamed up to solve this problem with the help of machine learning, 3D computer vision, and in advanced rendering techniques, the user's face is scanned and reconstructed as a 3D dynamic model. Now you can see the, you can see your face as the alien enters your field of view, and Google hopes to make this technology available to YouTuber, YouTubers and creators as VR becomes more widespread. I was kind of perplexed by why they bothered doing this, to be completely honest. The reason being is that... You see this in advertisements all the time. You see, you know, when uh, there's there's this uh, Battlefront VR commercial that came out uh, back when Rogue One, before Rogue One was a thing, and, and it showed the guy's face and how expressive he was under the mask because our, our human faces show a lot of emotion. And so I don't know what kind of modeling they're using, but I can imagine where it could potentially boost... YouTube views if someone is seen to have a good time in virtual reality. You can't see them normally. But with this technology, you can project having a good time <laughs> behind that mask. Uh and and okay, so okay, I just thought of another application for this that might span ratings or that might span beyond ratings. So imagine you and I, Blake, are are sitting in a virtual space. We are we sure. are both in VR in a rendered environment and we're sharing the space and I look over to you and all I see is your avatar with a PlayStation VR on your head or something like that. Now, if I could see your face even if it's just virtually constructed, I at least have it, it feels a little bit more real to me. I'm not looking at just a headset. I'm looking at you as you are wearing the headset, but I can also see your face behind it so I know it's you. It's almost like an identity thing for avatars. That's that's kind of where I'm at. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I can see it for that purpose, uh, for sure. But this this seemed to be like a watching people playing VR through YouTube type of thing. Because, I mean, I mean, yeah, being able to have a much more immersive experience by not seeing the VR headset of your buddy right. who's playing a game with you or you guys are watching TV together or something like that. But this this seemed like for content creation, which, I mean, I've seen plenty of videos. I mean, that, the alien one for sure where people just strap on the headset and you right. see enough of a reaction out of them that ratings are definitely high. But it... Right, right. I mean, I, I could see your point for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's more about the technology and less about the the watching people play VR. I don't know. All right, what's up next? All right, so Disney's kid-friendly browser game, Club Penguin, is famous for rapidly banning the f- use of foul language. <laughs> now that the game has... <laughs> Only a little over a month to live. Players have turned to getting banned for foul language into a speed running challenge. Yeah. With the current, yo. Oh, I was just saying, yeah. Let's oh. get banned. <laughs> <laughs> Keep okay, going. with the current record time under forty seconds, that is so fast. And this is held by the Canadian hero himself. Two KRN for you. I'm not even sure what that what that says. I know I'm missing it. But the game follows best practices for showing error messages, though. When you're banned, the ser- you're informed that you're banned from the server automatically for saying a bad word, and it even shows you <laughs> the phrase that you used. And I love this <laughs> so much. Please, if you're listening to this, go check out the article because the one that they show is hilarious. <laughs> it um, really is. <laughs> it is. It's awesome. It's, I, it's my favorite. <laughs> you know what? This used to be a family show. <laughs> the message reads, banned, colon. The server has automatically banned you for saying a bad word. You said, man, where the fine-ass penguin bitch is at? <laughs> See? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I love that, one, they <laughs> ban you for that. Because, yeah, the, it's fine. It's supposed to be targeting kids. Like, right. You shouldn't be on there cussing or whatever. But the best part is that it bans you and then shows you why which is everything you're supposed to do like that yes. is a best practice 110 yeah. percent kudos but this is just a hilarious instance of it oh kudos to club penguin for uh so now for for following best practices so now i i i question i i'm reading i'm skimming through the article um <laughs> they even logged it on speedrun.com which is just awesome oh, yeah. to me. <laughs> okay so yeah so so for context here they are going from a fresh browser window, right, to uh, getting kicked off. Now, this is, I believe this is signing up for uh, for an account as well. So, Oh, yeah, you have to enter your email and, like, you, it's a legit account service type thing. Right, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, no, you have to search for it. You have to log in. You have to make an account. And then you have to verify that account. And then you log in after the account's verified, and then you get kicked. Um, I'm watching it right now, and, uh, like, literally in the time that we're talking about this, they have opened up the window and have already gotten banned. This is pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. They didn't use that phrase, but the, I think that phrase... Oh, hey, there's there it is. Oops, you used a rude or inappropriate phrase. There it is. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're going to go get banned from Club Penguin after this. What's up next? <laughs> All right. So the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, a.k.a. the IEEE, unearthed a fascinating 2013 study that showed a cute dog tail does more than just amuse. It can communicate. 2013, where's this thing been? Hiding under a rock? But anyway, Probably. the study created by Ash- Ashish Singh. Apologize if I messed your name up, man. And James Young posited that a Roomba with a tail attached, think literally a Roomba with a feather duster attached to the back of it, could communicate quickly and easily with a human. For example, having a fast, excited wag could mean that things are going okay, from the Roomba's point of view, while a slow side-to-side motion could show disdain or mean disdain. So these tails are posited to be a cheaper alternative to microphones or speakers that still allow for human interaction with robots. Now, this was just a trip to me to look at. Like, it's it's 100%. It's a Roomba, Roomba with a tail on it. It is. Um, so this is this is um, not interesting because I don't want to say that. This is uh, humans have this amazing knack to pick up on animal um, social cues as well, right? Like... When I look at my cat and I see their tails are fluffy, then I know they're not in a good mood. And so I won't go up and approach them. Right. And I feel like a lot of people have this really in-depth sort of nonverbal communication with their pets. And it's 
a really novel idea to go expand that onto robots and see how robots can interact with humans in that same way. I'm very yeah. I mean, excited. it's very, it's expanding on what we already do. Um, yeah, I'm very excited. I'm very excited about this because one, it's not just like an a, a robot analog of um you know a pet it's i saw in the news there was this thing where they they like disguised a robot as an animal so they could go put it out in the wild and get pictures but they had to get the the all the uh idiosyncrasies i guess of of that animal's uh nonverbal communication right in order to implant it into these societies but this 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 goes beyond that because this is an actual device with function for the human and the human can tell system status in a non-traditional way. I'm Yeah, I mean you're you're ultimately going to be developing a a very different kind of relationship with technology. Like it, that's literally what you're doing. You're all of a sudden understanding it on like a gestural level right. versus just what like just looking at your phone you're now seeing kind of how the robot's interacting with the world. Does it need help? Right. Is it doing what you think it should be doing? Uh, quick shout out to um, Kirk Hamilton over on uh, Kotaku split screen. He does, he does this week, as a joke. He does, he got a Roomba a couple weeks ago and he does this weekly Roomba report on their podcast. Um, it's just, it's ridiculous. He treats it like a pet. Uh, I just thought it would, was funny. We should let him know to put a tail on that sucker. Right? Yeah, he could put a tail on it, and then uh, he could do his next Roomba report with a tail. Okay, what's what? this is the last one. What's up next? All right, guys, we're returning to Disney for the final story of the day. So Disney, of all companies, has developed a method for wirelessly powering an entire room using free-roaming wireless power. So free-roaming wireless power has been a dream of engineers since the days of Tesla, the man, not the company, and Edison, waging their, waging their war on innovation, but a number of technical hurdles have prevented it from becoming a reality. The folks at Disney Research have revealed that they successfully built a method to provide full coverage of an average room and power all the devices one might need in that room. So this includes like your phone as well as just regular devices like lights you'd find in a room. There's only one drawback. The room has to be specially designed with a giant copper pole in the center of the room. So it's not quite so average after all. And it's, it kind of seemed like it, it might be hazardous. I don't know. The picture it, in this article didn't make me feel very warm and fuzzy about this thing charging all of the did you, uh, um, devices in the room. Did you watch the video? I didn't know. So, I didn't even know there was one. Yeah, there's Shoot. a video on this, and it's... it's uh, Basically, what they're doing, I got to hand it to these guys over at Disney Research. This is this is awesome. This is a pipe dream that I have had for a very long time, and they've they've come up with. So, basically, what they do is it um, that that pole in the center of the room. I believe it works off like magnetism, so it's actually creating magnetic, um, uh, rag- magnetic frequency in in the room. I I think that's how it works. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I yeah, I think you're right. I'm re- rereading over the article. It sounds about right what they're talking about. Right, and 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 the power of it is so low. You could only power like a fan or um, what else did they like LED lights? Like the the voltage on this thing is very low. You're probably not going to get affected by it. I mean, you have that voltage running through you all the time anyway. Very very cool, very cool. I would love th- that that they have basically this um, LED ball that they have in this video and they're just tossing it around and there's no no cords, no nothing, no even um, no electronics inside other than the LEDs themselves. It's it's really fascinating to watch and the fact that we're there, I can, and this is by Disney Research. Imagine the next time you go to Disneyland, you're going to walk into a room and stuff is going to be floating and flying without any, uh, any cords attached. It's going to be, it's going to be something, man. Yeah, man, the Haunted Mansion is probably gonna get, about to get a whole lot sicker, oh, so props to Disney. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, do you have any closing thoughts on, on the news stories this week? No, not really. A lot of, lot of Disney, a lot of YouTube, but Disney, all YouTube, interesting. Google, 
Human brain interface. All right. Well, that's it for Human Factors news this week. Let's switch gears a bit and play a game. We're going to play Guess That Human Factor. It's a game where I will read this week, since Billy's not here, the description of a Human Factors construct, topic, research area, or pretty much anything else. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Blake here guess what it is. This week's topic comes from our listener by the username Last Chance. Last Chance writes, Hey, guys, could you use redacted, redacted, or redacted uh, for guess that human factor this week? Do I get picked automatically because today is my birthday? Well, you did get picked automatically because today is your birthday. Happy birthday to Last Chance. Um, let's go ahead and start this off. I have these here, and uh, I'm going to read them to you, Blake, and you are going to have to guess what they are. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. This first one, the process of adapting a product, uh, sorry, the process of adapting a product to meet the linguistic, cultural, and other requirements of a specific target environment or market. Well, shout out to Last Chance for throwing out a hard one at the first time. Uh, <laughs> all right, so can you read it one more time? Sure. The process of adapting a product to meet the linguistic, cultural, and other requirements of a specific target environment or market. Hmm, the process of adapting a product to meet the market's needs. To meet the linguistic, cultural, or other requirements of a specific environment or market. What are you thinking? Ah, oh, man, this is really tough. It, it, it's throw, I think it's throwing me off because it's linguistic. But it's make it actually funny enough. It's making me go back to that uh, bidet, <laughs> bidet story we wrote because that's that's all I can think of. Like, because you're basically adapting something so it's everybody can use it or people in that culture understand it. Right. Uh, it's not cultural adaptation. That doesn't make any sense. Mm. Nick, I'm going to say you might have me on this Ooh, one, man. No, last chance has you on this one. Let's, yeah, last chance and stumped me one time. Happy birthday. You got Blake. Just take a stab in the dark. Take a stab in the dark. Yeah, all right. Linguistic, cultural. So in my head, you've got to do, you're doing a little bit of research about wherever this thing is going to be deployed. Right. So it's kind of like market research, but it's not, that's not quite the end of it because it's a process of taking that and then making observations based on where it's going right it sounds like something i would do but i can't put a name to it uh let's go with um the, gosh i have no idea oh man okay are yeah. you ready for it are you ready for it yeah i am okay uh, it's localization localization yeah typically there's a localization team on products uh that will translate an entire uh product or program for uh a team or for for users in another country you know i'm gonna i have no problem admitting that i've never heard the term localization used like that okay so that's that's really cool all right i actually like that a lot anyway yeah, fair enough. he got you have he another. got you we, we have a winner. We me. have a winner. Last right. chance. Killing it. Well, hang on. You get your chance to strike back here. All right. So this next oh, one. Oh, is this a two out of three this thing? Is, this is a two out of three. This is a two oh, out of three. Oh, last chance. I'm coming back, my man. All right. I don't know. These last two he gave you are pretty easy. So I don't know. He, I, I think he still gets props for getting you, but let's see here. This next one. Testing repeatedly as the design converges on a proper de decision. Testing repeatedly. As the design converges on a proper decision. What is that, like iterative design? Boom. All right. We're one for one. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All right. Let's see. I, I think you'll... I have a strong feeling that you'll get this last one. Uh, let me... F there it is. Okay. So this last one, live site testing technique where a percentage of site visitors are shown an alternative version of a design. The effectiveness of the two designs is then compared. Mm, I think that is what they call in the industry A slash B testing. Oh, I was looking for A dash B test. No, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. All right. Those were great suggestions last chance. That was that was phenomenal. You you got Blake on one of them. 
Yeah, yeah for sure. that was happy that was birthday, good. Man. Yeah, happy birthday to uh, last chance there. That's it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for games, topics, or news stories you want us to cover, you can follow us on social media. You can head on over to the Human Factors Cast Facebook site, comment on our SoundCloud, reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. You can also send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail dot com. If you want to be cool and uh, have your voice featured on the show, if it, as long as it's clean, because this used to be a family show. Uh, leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We love it when you guys support us financially. and helps us keep doing what we're doing on a weekly basis. basis. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes. Make those reviews good. We're also on the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, wherever your podcasts are found pretty much. I want to thank Blake Arnsdorf being on the show today where can they find you they can find me on twitter at don't panic ux leave me a comment guys i'll tweet back at you we still have in the notes ux chill bro but don't panic ux that's where you can find blake as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me on linkedin or twitter at nick underscore rome thanks again for tuning into human factors cast until next time it depends it depends